Well, uh, we're starting today a new series right after we just finished a series on revival. And, you know, I kind of had to think for, for, a, for a while. I'm like, well, how do you follow a series on revival? You know, what, what comes next after that? And, uh, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but as we went through these past weeks, these three weeks on revival, um, we were challenged. I was challenged in some pretty, pretty great ways. You know, we went through some scriptures that were difficult to digest, meaning it made me uncomfortable because anytime we really get into God's word and see what it says, I don't think that there is any kind of comfort level to, for us to sit here and think, you know what? I have completely arrived. I'm doing everything God wants me to do. I'm in really good shape. I don't think that thought went through anyone's mind over these last few weeks. We were challenged. And, and you know what? It was a great time for us to be honest with ourselves. And, and maybe you have a really close individual that, that you could even be transparent with and say, hey, these are things that need to happen in my life, you know, that God is working on in my life. And I just happen to think, you know, what, what happens so often, though? Because that was a great three weeks. And, and what happens so often after we experience something great? Think about this. I don't know if anyone's ever been on a, on a marriage retreat before where you spend the weekend learning as a couple and, and seeing what God's word says, and it brings you together nice and close, you know, a husband and wife. And you come back after this marriage retreat, and you just feel like your love is renewed. And uh, then life happens. And you start to fall back into the same ruts and patterns that you've been in before. Or maybe it's after you've returned home from a mission trip. And over the time you were on this mission trip, you know, you kind of just felt God's presence in such a strong way, and it kind of gets you on this spiritual high. And then when you come back to the home and, and back to normal life, you kind of start going back to those things you were doing before, you know, like some extra sleep or, or maybe some extra time watching TV instead of spending that extra time in God's Word. Maybe you get back from vacation and that diet never starts back up again. <laughs> What happens, though, oftentimes is we start to pull away from that experience that we had. And, and, and let me ask you the question maybe this way. Have you ever driven down a road that has really deep ruts? Anyone? Now, this could be a paved road or it could be a dirt road. And, and most people would probably think like a dirt road. But, I mean, there are even some paved roads around here where, like, if you try and get out of the rut, like your car is doing this number right here, and then it wants to pull you right back into that rut. And if you've ever been off-roading or, you know, on a, on a dirt road that has some real deep ruts, I don't care if it's a four-wheeler or a truck or something, I see some smiles. So right now I'm assuming some people have been out four-wheeling before. But you get into these ruts, and they just pull you in. And you can fight with all your might to try and get out, and the tires are spinning against these ruts to try and get up out of that area. But... But it's so difficult to do that. You have to fight to get out of that rut. And then I'll tell you what, you better watch very closely because one, one slip of the wheel and you're boom, boom, right back in those ruts. It happens. And what I was thinking of this week is, is simply this. God laid this on my heart is too often in life we fall back into these ruts of the normal. We just hit this big series on revival. We were all challenged in great ways. My greatest fear this morning is that we're going to let ourselves fall back into these old habits. One of the habits that we fight against in our culture is the pursuit for more things. Okay, now, over these next four weeks, I'm actually going to be preaching today and these next three weeks. Uh, while my dad is out at some different areas. And so I just kind of thought about, you know, some different things. You know, we're, we're going to be talking about um, pursuit of more today. We're going to be talking about money and stuff. We're going to be talking about perfection. That's a big one for me. We're going to be talking about approval and comfort. So there's some big things here. But I, I want you to imagine with me, I, I, I imagine that many of you battle with believing a lie, like I do, that if I can just get this thing over here, and, and I don't know what this thing is for you, 
But I believe that sometimes if I can just get a little bit of this thing, you know, this, this is what I need to make me happy. Or this is what I need over here, just a little bit of this more uh, to have a fully uh, satisfied life. And, and this thing over here, this is the thing that's missing. And if I can just get a little bit more of it, and, and then you start to get a little bit more of it, and you kind of end up realizing that it didn't really satisfy. It didn't really satisfy that need that you had. And so then you start thinking, well, if I could have just a little bit more, and, and, and you start to realize that uh, this thing over here promises you a lot of stuff, but it doesn't always deliver. And so this morning... I want to fight against this old habit and talk about a revival killer. That's really what we're talking about here this morning. We talk about having personal revival. And personal revival is what? When God comes down in our life. When he comes down in a powerful way. So my, my series as we go through these next weeks is, what's going to kill that revival in our life? It's falling back into these old habits. The continual pursuit for more. So I want to talk about something today. <clears throat> that I think is pretty relevant in our day and age, uh, probably more than any other time in history. And, and what I want to look at today is the pursuit of fame. The pursuit of fame. You know, it's this idea of like, I want to be known. I want to be admired. I want to be liked. I want to be followed. I want to be accepted and respected and famous. And, and probably some of you this morning are sitting there thinking, um, hey, I'm not pursuing that in my life. I'm not pursuing fame. And, I, and I'm going to tell you this morning, you might actually be surprised. In many ways, you might be surprised that all of us are. You may not be in full-blown pursuit of fame. But in a small way, maybe not full-blown, but in a small way, maybe even some micro-cravings. For fame. We want to be known and loved and, and accepted. And you might find this showing up in small ways in your life. For instance, this one speaks to me. When you overcommit, when you overcommit, you end up doing more than you'd like to because you don't want to let anybody down. You have this deep need inside of yourself to be liked by everybody. And because you have this micro craving of wanting to be loved and, and fame and, and everything, you end up saying yes to things that you'd rather say no to, and you find yourself to be overcommitted. For some people, it could be that they're overly sensitive to any type of criticism. You don't want any kind of rejection. If 100 people told you you did a great job, and then one person said they didn't like what you did, you would fall apart. Because it's that micro craving for fame. You know, I want everybody to like me and to accept me. And social media today is perhaps one of the best breeding grounds for this hunger for fame. You know, you put a picture out on Facebook or Instagram and you start checking to see how many likes do I have on that photo. And I work so hard just to get this beautiful caption. Some people today will delete a photo within five minutes if it doesn't get enough attention. And I find myself, uh, you know, upset because, you know, I didn't get this or I didn't get that and, and I didn't get as many likes and longing for love. Now, understand me, there's nothing wrong with putting stuff out on Facebook, pictures and images and, and sayings. We all do it. And it's a great way to show. What I'm talking about is when we live for how many people like the content that we're putting out. And, and for those of you that might be above this, you know, you're, you're not hungry to be liked or known or admired or respected or anything like that. I want you to help you understand something, that chances are your children or your grandchildren might be struggling with this. Research shows this. This is very interesting. For kids who are age 10 to 12 right now, their number one goal, their top desire in life it's not for financial security. The number one goal is not to be rich. It's not for success or achievement. It's not even for community or great relationships. The number one top common goal for age 10 to 12 is to be famous. 
to be broadly known and accepted and respected. It's to be famous. Research also shows something else that I found pretty interesting. People in between the ages of 22 to 37, okay? And I'm not going to make you raise your hand if you're in that age group. Jerry, you put your hand down. I know that. I know better. Listen to this. If you fall in that age group between 22 and 37, 50% of people in that age group believe that their life should be made into a movie. Not to be mean, I do find that sort of funny. 50% of people in between 22 and 37 believe their life should be made into a movie. Research asked people, what would, you, what would you do to be a household name, to be widely recognized? What lengths would you be willing to go to? One in 12 people said that they would disown their family to become a household name. One in nine would give up on the possibility of marriage to be broadly known. One in six would give up having children. And depending on whose kids they're hanging around, that percentage might even go up from there. But one in six said they would give up the uh, possibility of ever having kids if they could be famous, their name widely known. Basically, people would give up a lot today, a lot of what we would consider to be important in order to be famous or widely known. Now, I think I need to pause right here and just make sure that we all understand and make this absolutely clear, it is not wrong to be famous. There's nothing about being famous that's sinful whatsoever. In fact, if you excel in what you do, if you're one of the best of the best and brightest of the bright, if you're incredibly talented, if you rise to the top of your field, fame is almost inevitable. In fact, uh, we're starting up a men's series this week. We had talked about doing a study by Tim Tebow. Anyone here recognize that name, Tim Tebow? Is he famous? He certainly is. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, you could make an argument that there are times when God makes people famous. So if you're following along with your handout, we're going to look at a verse in 1 Chronicles chapter 14. And what we see here is David was obedient to God. Here's what it says. 1 Chronicles chapter 14, starting in verse 16. So David did as God commanded him. And they struck down the Philistine army all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. So David's fame spread throughout every land, and the Lord made all the nations fear him. Now, if you're reading that in kind of a funny way, it sounds terrible that David and his army went and struck down the geezers, you know? Is that what they would have been called if you lived in geezer? Is you were a geezer, like the geezers or something? <clears throat> That's a side note. That's a side note. But let me tell you this. Here's what we see. David was obedient to God, and his fame spread throughout the land. God made David famous. Evidently, God also made Solomon famous. And if you don't know his story, Solomon, David's son, was offered, uh, God offered him a request. He said, ask me anything you want and I'll give it to you, almost like a genie, right? He says, what one wish would you like? I'll give you anything you want. And here's what Solomon said. He said, you know what I want? He's like, I want your wisdom. Give me your wisdom. And, and God was like, wow, since you asked for wisdom, you didn't ask for riches and fame. He said, I will not only give you wisdom, but I'm also going to give you riches and fame. There's nothing wrong with being famous. Jesus, I think you could argue that Jesus was famous, right? He raised people from the dead. He opened blind eyes. He healed deaf ears. And when he taught, crowds of people would go around him, so much so that sometimes he had to step out onto a boat off of the shore just so that he could, because everybody crowded in so tight, just so that they could see him. Jesus was famous. People followed him everywhere. He was famous. 
There's nothing wrong with being famous. Now, I need to share with you this morning. You may not know this already about me, but I'm kind of famous. I am. Not for, you know, playing guitar or singing or speaking. Uh, Maybe slightly famous for my dad jokes. At least Caleb kind of makes me feel that way because he laughs at every one of them. But not for that. When I was really young, my dad used me and two of my brothers as voices for a TV commercial. You wouldn't have recognized me because I was a water droplet. So it was an animated TV commercial. You wouldn't have recognized me. Uh, My brothers were water droplets as well, but I only had one line. I actually only had one word. As the sprinkling system popped up and, and started shooting water out, me and my three brothers, our one famous line, we all went, Wee! Because we as water droplets were being flung way out into the yard. Now, Ben, my older brother, you know, he got to say a full line. And if I remember correctly, he said, green lawns are easy with a Toro sprinkling system. Was that the line? Okay. I didn't have to memorize it. Did anyone see that commercial back in the 80s? It was a water droplet. You did? Oh, see? Okay. I will be happy to sign an autograph. Right after the service, if you would like. By the way, I think we're still waiting for our checks, you know, for, uh, for that. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I want you to understand it's not wrong to be famous. But listen to this. A pursuit of fame can be very, very dangerous to your faith. Pursuit of your of fame can be very dangerous to your faith because the trajectory takes your heart away from God, away from other people, which is our main concern, God first and people, and it moves it toward myself. And you see how much that plays against revival. When God comes down, we talked about what we need to do is die to self and live for Christ. And when we're pursuing fame, it's you die to these things. These things have to diminish so that self can be the main thing. It's very difficult to be focused on others when so many others are focused on you. And it moves the trajectory of your heart away from the things of God. And and what's fascinating to me is, uh, is, is, is we talk about this subject is, is how much things have changed. You know, if you look back through the decades and centuries, um, you can see the nature of and the accessibility of becoming famous is, is very different than it is today. If you go back a few decades or maybe even way back in time, you know, a few centuries ago, uh, you, you had to do something significant in order to be famous. You know, maybe you were the, the best in the field, like a science field, or, or maybe you competed in the Olympics as a top performing athlete. Uh, maybe you were a movie star or a famous politician. You were an inventor. Maybe you traveled to the moon, but you did something significant. Today, you can be famous simply because of the rise of social media, the rise of YouTube. You can be famous just by creating interesting content. You can be famous by creating silly content. You can be playing your guitar on the sofa and upload a video that goes viral and be famous for being great or be famous for being horrible. (laughs) Either way, you can be a cute kid on YouTube and have 10 million followers watch you open up new toys and talk about the toy. You can be famous for that. You can be famous for a lady. Uh, You could be a lady who uh, puts her face in bread and has become extremely famous on YouTube. You may not know what I'm talking about. This lady literally smashes her face into bread and has gone viral. Here, let's just take a quick peek right here at what this looks like. This is what this lady does. Her whole YouTube channel is about 
smashing her face into different types of carbohydrates. Now, my point exactly, it's amazing what you can do to become famous today, okay? You can be famous for being cute and working at Target as a checkout boy. Has anybody ever heard of Alex from Target? Has anybody come across this? Okay, Alex from Target. A lot of people know Alex from Target. Let's put his picture up here really quick. Alex was working at Target as a checkout boy, and a girl who was standing in line thought he looked kind of cute and decided to take his picture. She uploaded it to Twitter. At the start of that day, Alex had a Twitter account where he had 144 followers. His photo, Alex from Target, this cute boy that works at Target, went viral. At the end of that day, Alex had 300,000 followers on Twitter. The next day, he was on CNN just because somebody took his photo and put it online. So you can be famous for so many different things today. Years ago, you had to do something significant. Today, you can just be a cute kid working at Target. And that's the very reason why so many people hope and they dream. Perhaps maybe today is the day I'll do something that people will recognize me for. I was the one who originally uploaded the photo of Alex, or I am Alex, or something like that. And it'll go viral, and everybody will see it, and they'll like me, and they'll recognize me as this person. It's this need to be known. It's this need to be loved. And it's this need to have more attention from other people. And if more people follow me, then, you know, it satisfies these micro cravings that we have for fame. And a lot of times we think, you know, hey, if I just have a little bit more popularity in school, or if people recognize me for how well I perform in this sport, or if people know how talented I am as an artist or as a musician or for being funny, whatever it is, if they'll just, you know, give me a little bit more attention, then my life will be so much better than it is right now. And a lot of people think that's what I need to be happy. Again, I want you to understand something. Because this could be taken the wrong way. You can actually leverage attention. And you can build a following. You could put out great content on a social media platform and a lot of people gain a lot of attention. And you can use it to make a living, number one. But you can actually use it to make a difference in people's lives. Okay? So you have to understand it's not wrong to have attention or to be famous. But you have to be very careful because the pursuit of fame draws our hearts away from God. It draws our hearts away from others and it moves the focus of our life to something a lot more traumatic when that becomes our focus. Fame, even to a young person, can be incredibly hard to deal with. Even small doses of fame. You know what's interesting? That young man there, Alex from Target, uh, he ended up getting off of social media completely because the pressure of all of this attention ended up crushing him. Isn't that interesting? You know, what most people think would make them feel so much greater, he actually just had to step away from it. Here's an interesting uh, quote. Many people know Jim Carrey. He's a comedian. He's an actor. He said this quote. I find this very interesting. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything that they dreamed of so that they can see it's not the answer. Isn't that interesting? What is the answer? What is the answer? And I, I think in Scripture, as we get to this now, the person that had to probably have a great opportunity for fame, and, and, uh, and, but he ended up getting this right, was John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is the cousin of Jesus, and, and he was this prophet. He, he kind of dressed differently than everybody else. He wore animal skins. He ate wild locusts and honey. And, and he was out in the desert, and he created this big following. People would come to him. And, and he said, I'm here to prepare the way. And he would tell people to repent of their sins because the one was coming. The Messiah was coming. And he was very charismatic, and he was interesting, and crowds would come to him, and he grew in popularity. He kind of had these micro doses of fame, and people would even ask him, are you the one? Are you the one? And, and he would tell them, uh, you know, first off, let me just say, if he was raised in our culture, 
he would probably use that attention to kind of build a platform for himself. And he would still try and point people to Christ, but he would try and build up his own platform to be really well known. But that's not what he did. When they asked him, are you the one? He would say, no, 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 no. Don't confuse me with what I'm here to do. He said, I am going to point you to the one, Jesus. And his, his statement was that I'm unworthy to even untie his sandals. And what we're going to do is take a look at this account in John chapter 3. And if you're using our LifePoint Bible, it's page 1679. We also have the scripture for you on the handout. John chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 22. And here's what it says. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one that you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everybody is going to him. Now understand, that's Jesus. So John's out there baptizing people. But then there's a, some distance away, Jesus is baptizing people. And John's followers are like, hey, that guy over there, he's baptizing people and people are going to him. And here's how John responded. Verse 27, to this John replied, a person can receive only what is given from them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete here's the key underline this highlight it he must become greater i must become less john 3 30 that's a great verse to memorize he must become greater i must become less i want you to see more of him and i want you to see less of me because it's never been about me it's never been about me being known it's always been about him you see john the baptist could have taken a very different approach he could have had the same response as lucifer of course you know lucifer was the angel that wanted to be like god and was cast out of heaven and we know him now as satan John the Baptist probably could have said right there, hey, I'm nothing like Lucifer. And what he, what he would have been referring to is Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Because here's what it said. This is the, called the five I wills. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. That's what Lucifer said. And that was the absolute wrong attitude. And that's why he was cast out of heaven. And now we know him as Satan, the enemy. He said, I will be like God. I will ascend to the most high. I want to be known. I want to be famous. I want it to be about me. And John the Baptist, his response was radically different than that. He said, no, no, no. Don't confuse me with the one that I am coming to prepare the way for. I must become less. He must become greater. So how do we do that today? How do we do that in a culture that glorifies fame and creates this desire for 10 to 12 year olds to think, hey, I need to be famous. That's my number one pursuit in life. How do we function? How do we represent Jesus? It all boils down to that motive. And what I want to do is ask you two very pointed questions this morning. And I want to beg you to actually have the courage 
to answer these questions truthfully to yourself and honestly with yourself. Because I'll tell you what, our answers may not always be the right answer when I ask you these questions. It all boils down to motive. The first question is this, who are you representing? Who are you representing? You know, when you show up someplace, when you make a post online, when you talk with somebody, who are you representing? Now, don't give me the quick answer. See, I, I taught teens for a long time uh, as a youth pastor, and it's always amazing. We'd be in like a Sunday school setting or a small group setting, and you'd ask a question, and I got the same answer every time. They'd be like, Jesus, God, the Bible. Like, ever, like all three, it's like, it's got to be one of those. It's got to be one of those. And that's what we do. We're like, well, who are you representing? Jesus. I'm representing Jesus. And the question I need to ask you today, are you really representing Jesus? Because so often, our natural selves, our, our sinful natures creep in, and we want it to be about us. How how easily, have you ever just slipped into something like you were talking about something that was even like a good deed and then you were talking about, man, I was involved in helping or I was involved in building this or I was involved in doing this for somebody and all of a sudden that conversation where you actually kind of meant it for good, it just so easily slips in that now you're like drawing the attention back to yourself. You see what I mean? We all do it. Everybody does. We fight against it because our old nature always goes back to self. Who are we really representing? Are we, in, in everything that we say and do in our conversation and in our actions, is it always 100% less of me and more of Jesus? It's not. I mean, because we're not perfect. But I want you to understand the struggle there every day. How often we want to see, have others see something we've done, and it builds us up on the inside. Who are you really representing? This is what Paul says. And, and this is who Paul says that we should represent. This is in 2 Corinthians 5.20. He says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So if you're a follower of Christ, Paul says that you are called an ambassador for Christ. Do you know what an ambassador is? An ambassador is the highest ranking diplomat sent from one nation to another nation to represent the home territory. So if you're an ambassador for Christ, you are the highest ranking diplomat sent from heaven to earth to represent God. That's what you are. Who are you representing as an ambassador of Christ? When you and I, when we walk into the room, that means light walks into the room. The light of Christ, because it should be shining through us, right? When we walk into a room, hope walks into the room. It's only the hope of Christ. It's nothing that I can do. But when I walk into this room, hope walks into this room because I can share with people the hope of Christ. If my life is pointing and representing Christ, light and hope is right there. But it's not about Josh. It's not about me. Because I have nothing to offer anybody except to point them to Christ. Same thing with love. We're representing Christ by what we say, how we act, how we show love to one another, how we dress, how we post on social media. Whatever we do, it's always to bring glory to God. So who are we representing? So often we think we're representing him and, and it always comes back to us. And we need to be honest with ourselves and say, hey God, I need you to do a cleansing work in my life because it keeps coming back to me somehow and it's a struggle. And I need less of me. I need more of you. Number, number two question. Whose approval matters most? Whose approval matters most? Again, we know what the answer should be. Jesus. But so often we're playing to a crowd. We're laughing at jokes we shouldn't laugh at. We're trying to fit in. We're not shining the light when we should be shining the light because we don't want somebody else to not like us. 
I saw this skit one time, and it was a very interesting story. Uh, I just want to describe it to you because I don't have any actors up here with me, and I'm not going to play two parts. But <clears throat> this girl was sitting in her house, and there's a knock at the door, you know, and she goes over and answers the door, and it's Jesus. Now, this whole, this whole skit, Jesus never says anything, but he's there. And she's like, oh, Jesus, come on in and come on into my house and, and sit down. And then she gets a little startled because she realizes this TV show she's watching is probably not one that she would invite Jesus over to watch with her. She's like, well, let me just turn that off. And they're kind of talking. You know, she's talking to him. And, and uh, soon afterwards, she gets a phone call. And it's uh, some friends that are inviting her to come over to a party. And she's like, well, that sounds great. And, and she's kind of like, you know, but, you know, like Jesus is right here. But, yeah, let's just go ahead and go to this party. And so she gets up and she's like, all right, Jesus, um, I'm, I'm going to go to this party. I'll be back home later tonight. Um, you just go ahead and make yourself comfortable on my couch. I'll be back in a little while. And so she gets up and starts walking over here to, to, to the door. And Jesus gets up and starts moving with her. And she's like, no, Jesus, you have to understand. You, you're staying here. I'm going to this party. I'll be back later. This goes on a couple times. Finally, she gets frustrated that Jesus won't stop coming with her. And so she pulls out a hammer, and she nails his hand out this way, and she nails his hand out this way, and then she walks out the door. And it, I was thinking about this skit, and what a representation of it is. Whose approval matters most? Is it all my friends and what they're going to think if I don't go to this party? Or don't partake in this thing that's going on over here? Or is it Jesus? Suddenly, instead of living for the approval of God, we find ourselves often living for the approval of the crowd around us. And why do we do this? Why do people crave attention today? And want to be admired and respected and, and liked? And You know, it's like what a psychologist would tell us is that Sometimes we've had neglect in our life. Or sometimes we've had this, you know, craving to be noticed and admired because at some point in our life we maybe felt insignificant. Maybe we grew up with parents that had uh, high expectations and, and it was very difficult to, to please them. Or uh, maybe at some point we felt that like we were being rejected or overlooked by some of our friends. And so we have these micro cravings inside of us where we want to say, do you love me? Do you accept me? But here's what Paul said to this. And this is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. He said, On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. See, the good news is that God so loved the world, right? We know this from John 3, 16. The good news is that for God so loved the world that his one and only sin, son came down to die for our sins. We speak, you and I, as those who are approved by God. That's the only approval that matters. One day when you and I stand before God, we're going to be asked the same question. What did you do with the time that I gave you on this earth? Some people get these extremely, wonderfully long lives, 100 years. Some people, 60, 70, 20, 10. But you know what? We're all held accountable. What did you do with the time that I gave you on this earth? What did you do with the commands that I gave you in Scripture? And here's the point for this morning. We are called, we are not called, I'm sorry, we are not called to be famous. We are called to be faithful. We are not called to be famous. We are called to be faithful. As messengers approved by God, because of Christ, you are entrusted with the good news. And our purpose is to please God, not to please people. He alone examines the motives of my heart. On the outside, we can look great to each other, can't we? Man, look at that guy over there. Man, he's on fire for the Lord. Is he? We don't actually know. Only God sees the heart. Whose approval matters most to you and I? 
We have to always think less of me, more about his name. Less about follow me, more about follow him. And when everything in our culture is today says, hey, you need to be famous and you need to be known, you know, we have to recognize that that, that desire is rooted in sin. It's a false promise that it tells you like, hey, life's going to be better if you do this. But that's a false promise because it's not. We are not called to be famous. We are called to be faithful. And that's faithful to the one who is faithful to us. And when you live a life worthy of the one who gave everything for you, and, and you will stand before him one day in heaven, and Jesus is going to say to you, here's what he's not going to say. Hey, well done, my good and famous YouTube star. That's not what he's going to say, is it? No. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Going back to David in the Old Testament. David did what God commanded him. And God made David famous. But you know what David said? Now again, David was described in Scripture as a man after God's own heart. Do you know what David said? He said this in Psalm chapter 115. He said, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. And you might know a worship song that's based right off of that verse right there. Your name, the name that is above every name, the name at which one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess his lordship to that name, the name of Jesus, it's less of me and it's more of him. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, I feel that we need to come before you, Lord, and just confess and, and really be honest with ourselves this morning how easy it is, Lord, for all of us to want our lives to be about us and, and for us, Lord, to build a platform. Of. Even as, as we read, as, as what Satan said, I, I will become famous. I will ascend high. I will be like God, Father. We recognize how easy it is for us to slip into this rut of wanting to elevate our own platform that other people will see us and like us and, and appreciate us and, and feel some innate desire that we have for that, Father. But today, Lord, from your word, we want to have the posture and the attitude, Lord, that John the Baptist had. That he said, no, 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 don't put your attention on me. Put it on the one true Messiah. Put it on Jesus. And then he said, he must become greater. I must become less. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to realize when we're starting to do that in our lives. And the attention, Lord, needs to always be on you. And even after coming off this series about revival, Lord, I just pray for each one here. Don't let it be a time after this series is done. Don't let it be a time when we start to slip back into those old comfortable ruts and just go right back into where we were before. But Lord, let us be very cognizant each and every day of how we must live, Father, so that we die to self and that it's you living through us, Lord, and that's being broadcast to this world because that's what you've called us to do, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. amen.